Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. This is Chris M, and I'd like to welcome you to another conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experience. And uh, I'm going to try something real quick here just to see if this comes through. A little music here, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't look like it's going to come through. Because I'm not hearing it, neither is anybody else, evidently. So we'll just forget about that little option. Welcome. Welcome to today's program. And uh, before I, I get started with this, I would like to introduce Her Holiness, the Celtic Queen of Questionable Comforts from Kerry and Cork, Amelia Santara. Hi, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone in the chat room. I have the chat room up today, so hello everybody um, and everybody listening. Uh, good to be here as usual on a on a Wednesday. So I'll begin again as I usually do by giving people the address they can go to if they want to make a donation to Kundalini Awakening Systems, and that don't that place is www.ascension Kundalini dot blogspot dot com and on the upper right hand corner you will see a donate button and that's where you can make your donation to support the work that Chrism does and um, not only have we got the uh, blog talk here but there are lots and lots of other different places where you can get Kundalini information and where Chrism writes articles and gives of his love and support to people in a Kundalini awakening um, scenario, I suppose. So I'll just give it to you again. It's www.ascension-kundalini.blogspot.com and maybe you'd give the other addresses, Prism, of where people can go for information. And I'll, I'll try to do it at the same level of intonation as you are. Yes, so... When, Thank you. When, when Prism gives his love and uh, consideration, <laughs> he can also... You can also find some of that love and consideration <laughs> at YouTube on the YouTube network, and that would be Kundalini on the YouTube network. Also, Facebook at Kundalini Awakening exclamation point, uh, Kundalini Awakening Systems 2, Kundalini Awakening Systems 3, Kundalini Radiance Community, and the various Kundalini healing groups. We're also on the Yahoo! Uh, network and so that's Kundalini Awakening Systems One at Yahoo Groups and Kundalini Healing at Yahoo Groups and we're also on the Google Plus Network with Kundalini Awakening Exclamation Point and so on and so forth. Uh, the the blog that that uh, Amelia uh, gave is 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 the place the only place where we have any kind of a donation button and the donation is greatly appreciated. Uh, only if you can do it though, you know we're not trying to, to make a million billion dollars here. If somebody decided to donate a million billion dollars, that would be fine. That would just make sure that we'd be able to get uh, Kundalini Awakening on TV and, and in the movies and whatnot. So I would like to welcome, of course, uh, uh, Amelia Santara and Fasci and Steve Durecki and the guest 2981 Elizabeth Dalton Gonzalez, who I owe a very sincere level of apology to because I I didn't um, make our Skype meeting today. Uh, Celestial Rubies, hello, hello. And and Suka, hello, Suka, and Guest 3051, and all of you that are listening off of the chat room, welcome to today's conversation. Today's conversation is about why would the Kundalini compel us to eat meat. Okay, so many of us in the in, in Europe and in India and in uh, North America uh, confer levels of vegetarianism as being a spiritual guarantor of our ascension into the heavenly fields, which of course have no mammals, just plants, and and. How how could Kundalini, if it is indeed uh, of a divine quality, how could it, in its transformation of us, 
compel us to to eat meat in in uh, in contradiction to our our strongly held belief systems that vegetarianism is is the only spiritual path that is available to people who are really spiritual. And uh, and I would like to uh, to talk with uh, Amelia Centara about this as as Amelia Centara is currently a vegetarian girl. Isn't that right, Centara? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> that is correct, because I am. <laughs> I wasn't That's always. Do you want me to speak a little about that? Speak a little about that, if you want. Okay. Well, I would have been brought up as a child, and as I was growing up, I ate meat. In Ireland, we have meat with every meal and two veg and potatoes. And that's the way I was raised. And it wasn't until 2006 that I started, before I had my spinal sweep um, and before, you know, I had the Kundalini awakening, I was in an activation phase without knowing it. And I just went off meat. Um, and that was the way it was. I became a vegetarian and, you know, there were issues around if I ate meat, I would begin to feel unwell, that sort of thing. And for two years, I had no meat. And then without realizing it, I also went off dairy. I became a vegan without realizing I was a vegan for a while. And that lasted for two years. And then one day, I just got this compulsion that I was to have fish. And I was pretty horrified, really, at the idea of eating flesh again because for four years I hadn't eaten any. Um, But the compulsion was there, eat the fish, eat the fish. And I knew at this stage, you know, a communication from the Kundalini. I knew it was from the Kundalini to eat the fish, but I could feel a resistance to doing it. But because I knew when this comes, there is no choice, really. You know, I could, you know, postpone it and postpone it, and it wasn't going to go away. So I did. I I surrendered to that, knowing that it was from the Kundalini, and I ate the fish. And I have to tell you, from the first moment of tasting it, it was orgasmic. I mean, it was per- it was exactly what I needed to eat at the time. And... This continued. There was no other compulsion to eat anything but fish. And I did that for about another two years. And then last July, 12 months, um, suddenly it stopped. I was to stop eating fish. Now, I was enjoying my fish. (laughs) Now, I was to stop eating fish and it began to turn. I, I wasn't able to. Again, I was in resistance initially, you know, going, what? But again, I knew it was Kundalini, and Kundalini, I just began to feel unwell when I was eating the fish, and it really didn't suit me at all, and so I stopped eating the fish. And so it has been now for however many months that is, 12, 13, or 14 months. And so I'm vegetarian again. But it's about, it's not to do with me, really, or my ego, or my, my choices. It's the Kundalini directing me in this way. And I don't have any choice about it, really. The end. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to ask me something, that's fine. But that's that's okay. the end of the monologue, it, anyway. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so you, what you're telling me is you don't eat meat now, right? Right. I do not eat meat now. Do you eat eggs? <sighs> I do, do, you, do, you eat, do you eat avian placentas? What's that? <laughs> it's an egg. Oh, yes. oh, we call them something else. Okay. Um, yes, I do eat eggs. So you partake of avian placentas, right? That is one way of, of saying it, yes, I do. This is, this is what I find happening quite a bit. Um when a person turns vegan or vegetarian, they all of a sudden start adopting phrases like eating flesh or, you know, know so true. dead, <laughs> dead mammalian carcass. You know, I mean, uh, they, start, they start making a, a very large separation between themselves and the, the other folks who might uh, partake of, of flesh on purpose or, or the meat on purpose, 
And, uh, you know, this this is really, it's interesting. I mean, you, you know, you give humans something to disagree on, and they're going to compete it, about it over and over and over, no matter what, even even subconsciously. We, mm-hmm. uh, yes, we, I would certainly have called it flesh um, because it, was, it became so repulsive to me. But you never uh, called personally. it flesh when you were growing up, did you? Absolutely not, no, no. But I was never repulsed by it either. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. It it cha- it the whole dynamic changed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, even you know, as you went, you know, purely vegan, which just reminds me of some sort of an alien star system, Vega. But okay, okay, okay. I'm just gonna stick with vegan here. <laughs> when you, when you turn vegan, it's even it's even more of an issue. It's even more of a of a social uh, um, statement of, mm-hmm. of your choice in what you will consume uh, in comparison with uh, the choices that other people's make, and which one is which one has more of a virtuous uh, uh, expression than the other. And well, I just need ahead. to say, and then I go blue. And um, that wasn't where I was coming from, though, Quizzen, in terms, or am I being defensive, in terms of, you know, what other people did with what other people did. It's what, the, the veganism just happens to be the name that covered the way my diet went. I get it. I get it. And I, you know, I, yeah. have, I have come over to your house and I visited you and, you know, you've cooked chicken and you cook, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, meats for your family, you know, it's just you, you yourself don't partake of them so much. Um, but what I find, you know, within the social context of uh, vegetarianism versus uh, uh, carnivorism is that there seems to be a real uh, separation by those who uh, through their religion, you know, like Hinduism is, is a completely vegetarian belief system uh, and so Sikhism seems to be and I don't know uh, whether that is uh, specifically true maybe some of the Sikhs out there can call us in and and correct me on this but I have a I think they are also a completely vegan uh, religious system and, and the scenario is is when you're in these systems your belief system becomes your social system at the same time and and uh, as as uh, you know if you if you google uh, vegetarianism uh, versus carnivorism on the on the you know on the internet well you're going to see these great long discussions about inflicting pain and cruelty on the animals and and how this is such a terrible thing that that how would you like to have your your arms torn limb from limb and your jugular vein drained out as you're hung upside down in order to harvest the meat that you're all swung around on a wheel and, and uh, you know, conveyor belted to people that are like hatcheting off your legs and arms and hands and head and, and filleting out, you know, certain aspects of your body. And, I, you know, I, I can totally agree uh, with them that that, w- that is not a very uh, inviting um, understanding to to come into and so this is really why i suggest that you well it's kind of inappropriate for our society to go out and hunt we don't like to hunt for our own food we are a society certainly here in the western united states or or actually all of the united states some parts of canada and uh and, and and some parts of Europe as well, that where we get our food is from the grocery store. And people are raised, well, well where do you get your food, honey? The grocery store, mommy. You know, and so, and so people are indoctrinated into the understanding that really your food comes from a store, not from the environment. And as people, as people are, are allowed to to believe this, and then you know, a certain form of an untruth is being given to them. Now, I was I was raised on a on a on a working farm, and you know, we had the turkeys and chickens and peacocks and cows and horses and doves and quail and cats and dogs and chickens. I think I said chickens. We had a lot of animals 
uh, that were with us that 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 were in a way uh, used uh, by the humans that were taking care of them. But we took care of them. We made sure they had food. We made sure they were safe. We made sure they had water. We made sure that their that their stalls were clean and that they had, uh, you know, a, a free range of movement and, and fresh air and sunshine and the ability to socialize with each other and all of these things. And and even you know, you know, when they chose when they chose to get out, boy, let me tell you, they could get out. It's so easy for a cow just to lean up against that fence, and there goes that wood. And even the barbed wire doesn't really, you know, affect them unless you electrify it. And we never really did that. And so we really took care of our, of our, of our animal companions. And they, in turn, took care of us. As we fed them for years and years and years, they also fed us for years and years and years. And it, there's a certain balance within that. Now, as you go to the grocery store and you look at the, uh, the options that you're giving, well, everything is is wrapped in plastic and placed on styrofoam in the meat department. Or it's there in a window. and You don't see the hooves. You don't see the, the, the skin. You don't see the eyes. You don't see the nose. You don't see the, the spirit of the animal. There. You don't, it's not staring back at you. And a lot of kids, you know, uh, have no idea that when they're eating a hamburger that they're eating an animal. And if they did know that they were eating an animal, they would spit that food out. They would spit that food out, no doubt about it. Uh, there is a place uh, for vegetarianism. Veganism, I'm, you know, I have a little bit more of a problem with because it's lacking vitamin, 12, vitamin B12 and some of the other uh, very necessary building blocks of a continuation of, of a healthy life on this world. But vegetarianism, I have no problem with that. Matter of fact, I myself am like 75, 80% vegetarian already anyway do to the to the instruction of the Kundalini in me, okay, um, and so that is that you know I'm coming at this you know from my own experiences, but also from like Amelia's experiences and and other people's experiences when it comes to to vegetarianism. Now I you know I was raised in a in a step family that would you know you were given a gun at the age of twelve and you go out hunting hunting it's not hunting it's hunting. <clears throat> You got to put the mm in there, and so we'd go out hunting, <laughs> and we would, you know, hunting for doves and ducks and geese and deer and and things of that nature. And, and to me, that's still not right. Using technology to take down an animal is would be like aliens phasering us with a phaser in order to stun us so that they can go ahead and butcher us. This is not okay. You go out there and you give that animal a good chance to 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 evade you. Don't make it so unfair. Okay? Bows and arrows, I'm you know, I'm basically good with even though that's just another form of technology. Okay? But rifles that can drop a deer at a thousand yards? Are you kidding me? This they call this sportsmanship. It's just slaughter in the wild, is all that is. It's just turning the you know the forest into a slaughterhouse because you know there's no way the deer is going to hear you, smell you, know you're there at such a distance. I mean, why don't you just get an, an RPG, rocket propelled grenade? That way you don't have to take it to the butchers. You can just have it right there, ground up, perfect. Make your hamburgers right there at the campfire. Or deer burgers, as it so it may be. Now, within a Kundalini context, it's we've been placed on this world to have the Kundalini, and the Kundalini has placed us on this world in these bodies that require certain levels of energetic nutrients that just eating plants doesn't really cover. You know, even with Amelia eating her avian placentas, you know, that's that's a level of, of, of food consumption that just plants will not cover. And by the way, she's only eating those avian placentas because I've given her an instruction to do that. So if it were up to her, she would have no uh, problem not partaking of avian placentas. So just so you know that. 
And I just love calling it alien or avian placentas because it sounds it sounds so different than than you know you know eggs eggs you know we've been barraged with all that uh, advertising you know oh you're a good egg or oh you know eggs you know have eggs every day an egg you know and so and I will suggest that eggs are very good for the kundalini especially for the developing nervous system that the kundalini transformation is bringing about and so yeah 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 all of you and and, and you know celestial rubies. By the EDG, Fast G, Guest, 3051, 3094, 3095, 3096, MJ Henderson, Sigrid Edworthy, Steve Jarecki, and Sukha. I suggest you all eat eggs. And all of those that are listening to this conversation outside of the chat room, I would suggest that you you eat eggs if you are indeed inside of the Kundalini transformation. You'll hear my chair squeaking, so that's not yours. Nothing's wrong with the... uh, with the sound, as far as I know, um, it's always an, an issue with blog talk. So, uh, um, yeah, Steve, Steve, let me know if you're hearing this <laughs> talking, talking to the air. You know, I mean, I'm sure the air has a lot to get out of what I'm saying, but I'm really aiming it at you. So, if people can let me know if the sound is coming through. Anyway, so. Uh, with regards to what we're doing on this planet within the Kundalini, the Kundalini will give a person a, a a command or compel them to eat meat, and it's it's the that sound is good. Thank you, Steve. And I, I you know and I had chickens out here at the ashram for a while too for a good and wonderful, beautiful, wonderful. Uh, creatures, just the most loving and the most happy and the most natural, the most joyful. Chickens are great. Chickens are great. And I, I, I would suggest anybody who can to own them, specifically the hens, because, you know, they, they, they really, really, really take care of the environment. They do a very good job of taking care of the environment. And you just got to make sure you don't have weasels or foxes or other types of predators that will kill the chickens. Uh, which is what happened to our chickens. So, yeah, bad. Anyway, uh, we're here on this planet. Have, you know, Even without Kundalini, we're here on this planet, and we're given the opportunity to partake of different food choices. Uh, the food isn't necessarily all about the meat. It's also really, when you just get down to the basic building blocks of life, it is energy. It is energy of, a, of, a, of certain uh, frequencies that allow for other frequencies to be supported by the original frequency that, say, you're consuming. So, for instance, if you're eating a chicken, okay, well, a chicken uh, is an omnivore. Uh, they will, they will, I've seen a chicken eat a mouse right out of my hand, a mouse that I was giving a healing to, no less. I was showing my students, okay, look, here, we're going to give this healing to a mouse. Chicken comes up right next to me, and one guy. There was no mouse. It was just gone. It's just like it was so fast. It was amazing. So don't think chickens are vegetarians. They most certainly are not. And furthermore, they're eating fleas. They're eating ticks. They're eating mosquitoes. They're eating grasshoppers. They're eating crickets. They're eating uh, sow bugs. They're eating uh, uh, centipedes. They're eating worms. They are definitely not vegetarians. Even though they do, they eat grass. They love to eat the grass. They love to eat the, you know, the, the your vegetables when they're first coming up and your really hard worked vegetable garden. They'll come in there and they'll just take all those sprouts right out for you, just just in case you were worrying about having to work on them for the next three months. Chickens will take care of those plants for you. So do turkeys, by the way, and peafowl and guinea hens and all of these different avian varieties. They are all omnivores. They are not vegetarian. Whales, cetaceans, they are omnivores. They are not vegetarian. What do you think plankton is? And what do you think gets sucked up right along with the plankton? Plankton are sea are, are sea plants or microscopic, uh, not even some, not even microscopic, not microscopic, you know, krill. Uh, these are all plants and animals that the that the whales are filtering through their baleen in order to eat. 
Baleen is the 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 uh, filtration system that a cetacean uses in order to to uh, collect food from from the oceans that it swims through. Uh, whale sharks are also the same way. They are omnivores, not vegetarians. Okay, a vegetarian would be a horse, although sometimes a horse will eat an insect. But for the most part, the horse is like like their their vegetables for for their food as with cows and deer and moose and and caribou and antelope and you know all the various uh, um grazing animals buffalo uh cows et cetera et cetera and so what happens is is as we as we partake of the earth, so does the earth partake of us. Uh, as we as we uh, uh, as we give off uh, the solid excrement, uh, if we were living, say, in the Amazon jungle or in, in another kind of society that would that would promote um, soil building, uh, which the United States does not promote soil building, it, it promotes Monsanto, which is soil destruction, uh, vis-a-vis science and and chemical you know conversions of different uh, fertilizers within the soil uh in the amazon rainforest however there was a uh, there was a, a quite a large society about 500,000 people they're guesstimating and they used uh different levels of human excrement to reinfuse the soils that they that they had strategically planted certain trees and certain vegetable vegetation plants that they would use to support 500,000 people. You know, you know that some of those people had the job of taking that excrement out there and, and digging it in the soil. And this soil to this day, now this was probably about, you know, a few thousand years ago, but the soil in those areas to this day are what even clued the, the archaeologists in that there was a society there. The, the soil has a, has a, an extreme depth of absolute total uh, um, I, I want to use the word fecundity, but I'm not sure that that's a correct description. Very, very nutritious soil, exceptionally nutritious soil with traces of human excrement six feet below the surface of, of, of the ground there. And that, you know, when you when you when you take a soil sample that's six feet below, you know, you're basically time traveling backwards. And so and so they can kind of they can kind of discern what the diet of these people were and they can discern what's in the jungle at that time and they can see that, oh, this plant is there and that plant's over there. And oh my gosh, it looks kind of strategic. Looks like these orchards inside of the Amazon rainforest were put there intentionally to support very, very large populations of humans in a very different way than we do in North America and Europe and, and Asia and parts of, uh, you know, Brazilian South America. You know, Brazil Brazil's totally tied into Monsanto. You go down there and you see all these, these fields that are, you know, acres and acres of fields that have say, do not trespass Monsanto. Monsanto test plot, you know, it's a thousand acres. But anyway, I won't, I won't, I won't go there too much. Um, so yeah, so as we as we partake of the earth, the earth partakes of our of us as well, not only in our excrement but also in our body. And thus, we of course, uh, well, even when we incinerate ourselves, that ash goes into the earth. Even if you put it in the ocean, well, that is part of the earth. So, so we are what that world that we partake of, and it, you know, whether you partake of mammals or plants, both forms of creation have feelings. Both forms of creation, and the insects, and the fish, and the molds, and the viruses, and the bacteria, and the mushrooms, and the the phytoplankton and all the other levels of life that we haven't even yet discovered yet on this world and in this atmosphere. We are all partaking of those things. All life has an agenda of, of living. All of it does. 
And when that agenda is just is disrupted, uh, there are levels of anxiety, call it pain, call it anxiety, call it disruption, call it what you want. But it does occur. That occurs with mammals and insects and fish and spores and molds and bacteria and viruses and all of the above. So, so we really want to, as Kundalini people, we want to resist placing a judgment on people who are consuming the flesh of mammals. And let me tell you why the Kundalini will use the flesh of animals. It will use the flesh, we'll just say, of a deer. So Steve Jarecki and I, we, we, uh, we load up our bazookas and our cannon in our tank, and we go out looking for some deer. We want to see if we can uh, spot one 30 miles away and drop it in its tracks right there. Right, Steve? <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> we we want to we want to make sure that we get it with the first shot, and that we don't have to butcher it, so that we can you know have our deer burgers right there. And deer is one of the foods that the Kundalini will ask a person to eat. By the way, okay, uh, deer is one of those those sacred uh, animals that we would partake of. Venison is also what it's called. Uh, so as we as we take in the body of the deer, having thanked the deer, having shown true gratitude and true graciousness for the for what that animal is giving us uh, in its struggle to survive on this world, for what that animal is giving us, the life force within that animal is carried into each of the cells. This is a form of, of aggregate pranic energy, that life form, that life force. So that aggregate pranic energy is consumed uh, by the human being. And what that means is that, that, the, that the, for, the, for however many years that deer has been alive, it has been eating plants. It's been eating different plants, not all the same plant, but different plants throughout the forest, throughout the meadows, plants that in them themselves have been consuming prana, consuming sunlight, consuming minerals, consuming uh, uh, many of the bio, you know, biological and virological and, and, and uh, uh, different building blocks of the soil that that plant has been consuming. Well, that deer has been consuming everything, and it's been stored in its flesh. It is a compact form of energetic resource that is formed in the flesh of the deer. And when a person eats that, the kundalini uses those levels of compact energy in the flesh of the deer or the cow or the moose or the fish or the chicken or the or the egg, or any of these creatures. It uses that. It takes it apart. And it uses that energy for its transformation of our bodies. The Kundalini transforms our bodies. And don't ever think that the energies that the deer consumes through the plants, and the plants consume through the sunlight and the soil, and the soil you know, is, is, you know, consumes in the various ways that the soil and the mic and the, the microbiology within the soil consume each other. Don't think that that's, that that is just gone. It doesn't leave. Energy doesn't necessarily leave when it is consumed. It is utilized in certain ways, in certain combinations, in certain formats. And then it, is, it stays there. It stays there. We are a collection uh, energetically, we are a collection of the foods that we have eaten on a purely physical, you know, uh, standpoint. Uh, and as Steve so correctly says, taking that life is not easy. Uh, its memory lives within its food source. And this is absolutely true. Absolutely right. Uh, it isn't easy, and yet it isn't morally repugnant either. Why do you think the Kundalini uses snakes and tigers and lions and killer whales and wasps and spiders as its representatives for us to learn from. Is it wrong for a tiger to kill a deer? Is it wrong? I ask you. Is it wrong, Centara? She's thinking about it. So, well, how do I respond to that? I would... <laughs> 
<laughs> I was in the bathroom. No, it was blue. <laughs> and of course, it's not wrong. No, I mean it's, is it, it's is it wrong, natural. Is it wrong for a chicken to eat a bug? No, of course not. Is it wrong for a turkey to eat a bug? No. Is it wrong for a fish to eat a, a smaller fish? No, that is part of of their nature. That's part of their environment. That's how they survive. Right, right, exactly. So, you know, it is not wrong either for we who are within the Kundalini to partake of that fish or partake of that avian placenta like you do every morning. (laughs) Sorry. I, I, I know you. You're enjoying it, Thor. <laughs> so yeah. Um, now a lot of religious belief systems that are kind of set up in and around the 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 Indian subcontinent, or or even in parts of Asia, uh, you know, the Tibetans and the Buddhists, and you know, they have they have people that have come awakened with the Kundalini, but one of the enduring uh, messages that comes from their awakening is the Ahimsa principle, the principle of do no harm, do no harm. And I'm going to suggest that that Ahimsa, uh, with people that are not strictly vegetarian, still is in play. It is still a viable understanding. It is still a uh, an understanding that is that is worthy of living it's just that in order to live it one must live and in order to live one must have food and in you know and in order to have food one must go out and in some way collect it and in in when you're in certain areas of of the world where Vegetation isn't so so uh, available. Let's talk about uh, the tundra in northern Canada. How available is vegetation there? Well, it's not so available. Okay, there's some moss that you can scrape off a rock, but that's about what you're going to get. And so the the argument would be, well, those people must move away from that because you know they're not going to be practicing ahimsa, you know, if they're if they're uh, you know killing. Polar bears or caribou can't do that. Can't kill a whale. Okay. Well, it's just not so because ahimsa means to to do no harm, and this is going to be my Kundalini's version of ahimsa, and so this is probably not going to follow the standard Vedic or Hindu-based understanding of of the ideology behind ahimsa. With Kundalini, ahimsa is is basically have an appreciation for all life and do not go out of the way to kill life unnecessary. That is, it's an unnecessary death. Don't kill something for the fun of it. Don't kill something because it scares you. Don't kill something because, you know, because it's different than you are. You don't understand it. You can kill it if it's attacking you because you got to live too. You could kill it if you need to eat it because, you know, even that moss has its own life force agenda, is its own creative agenda uh, that God has placed on this world. And God did not place it on this world so humans could eat it. We are, you know, this whole Christian idea of stewards of the land is such a farce. You know, I mean, yeah. Wow. But anyway, so ahimsa is practice when you purposefully don't go out of your way to unnecessarily kill if you are killing to defend yourself or killing to, uh, to, to consume or to nourish yourself, that is within the understandings of Ahimsa. And I know many of the Indians are going to be going, oh, that is absolutely so not right. How do you know about our religion? You're not even a Hindu. And, and I'll have to agree with them. But I am Kundalini. And Kundalini is the source of Hindu, Christian, or Buddhist. So I am Kundalini. And the kundalini does not lie. And it does not perambulate around excuses for ego-based assumptions of what is or is not appropriate on this world. Okay. Kundalini is pretty straight to the point. 
And when it wants you to eat that meat, then it wants you to eat the meat. And it doesn't want you to to to, to struggle so much with, oh, my God, you know, I, I've been a vegan and I've been a vegetarian all my life. And, oh, God, you're not just says eat the meat and and obey the divine compulsion that you're receiving to eat that meat and thank the animal and have appreciation, have gratitude and have the graciousness to express it. Feel that animal's life. Feel that life force emanating from the, from the meat, from the cellular structure of that animal. And it's, and it's the life force that holds those cells together. So it's all through that meat. Be thankful for that meat. Be thankful for the gift of grace that that meat is giving you. And when the Kundalini tells you to stop, you stop. And now, now I know a lot of you will be saying, well, okay, uh, the kundalini didn't give me a verbal with that, so do I really stop? Well, the kundalini won't necessarily give you verbals, ever. It will give you compellings. It will give you a feeling, uh, like Magdalene said on the, some of the Facebook groups, you know, today, you know, she, she just, all of a sudden, she just can't eat a certain food. For her, it was cheese. Here I've had her eating cheese, cheese, cheese. You know, go ahead, have some cheese. It's got a good B12 component to it. It's got some good enzymes in it. Yes, yes, you know, try to back off on the salt, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then all of a sudden the kundalini says, no more cheese. And it doesn't say it to her, you know. I don't, I don't even know how to say that in French. You know, it doesn't say no more cheese. It tells her in ways of feeling, in ways of compulsion in ways of divine communication upon the person. It's a different form of hearing. It's a different form of understanding that has nothing to do with your five senses, has everything to do with your level of discernment, your level of discernment. And and the Kundalini typically makes that discernment really easy for a person to feel. Like like uh, I, Amelia Centara stated, you know, at the beginning she was, she was compelled to eat the fish. You know, it's not much of a choice, really. When you're compelled by the kundalini to do a certain thing, then you do that certain thing. And, and if you resist, well, then typically a level of, of, of declining health will ensue. Declining physical health, declining emotional health, declining mental health. You know, declining levels of health that you can really feel. And it doesn't take long to feel it. So it's very, very important for a person to pay attention to what the kundalini is communicating for them to do. And when it says you you stop eating the flesh, well, then you stop eating that meat. And you start eating those fruits or those grains or those vegetables. And in the same pattern that you thanked that deer or that cow or that moose or that caribou or that fish or that chicken or that turkey, in the same way, that you thank them for contributing to the force of your life. You thank the plants the same way. And you thank the soil the same way. You see, you follow the chain. And you can also see it by, you know, by thanking that turkey and being, you know, uh, having, you know, strong levels of gratitude for that turkey, that Everything that that turkey is comprised of is also thanked, including the soil, including the, the mineral kingdom that people rarely, rarely recognize as, as being sentient and conscious, when in fact it is. In fact, it is. Okay. This planet is, is a bastion of interconnected webs of different forms of life. Different forms of consciousness. And, you know, with science, you know, they've got such a narrow parameter. It's all got to be about humans. You know, well, if we can measure this and weigh this and, you know, see that or do that, then it's got to be real. If, it's, if we can't do that, then it's not real. Well, okay, fine. The scientists can go off on their little hunts for, for measurement equipment in order to validate certain forms of life expression, but that's their business. Within the Kundalini, we feel the emanations of life all around us. We feel the life of cement. We feel the life in the air that hasn't even been discussed. We feel the consciousness of clouds. We feel the emanations of starlight. 
We feel these things. These things are communicating with us. What do you think the nod or the nada is made of when you hear those sounds, those frequencies, those high frequencies in your ear? What do you think is composing that beautiful music? Okay. So I did want to touch on that in our conversation today. And and as we have been doing for the past uh, um, few episodes, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Her Holiness back online. And uh, we're going to answer some questions. But before we do, before we do that, I would like to bring Miss Minnesota USA into our beautiful conversation. And Miss Minnesota, hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. What a what a wonderful greeting, for heaven's sakes. I've never thought of that. Well, you know, you're the only Miss Minnesota that's been a nun, I think. <laughs> that you know. That I know of. That's right, that's right. And tell me, do you have any announcements that people might I be I do. In? Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, Minnesota is hosting our teacher again at the end of February for a seminar, February 21st and 22nd, here in on the St. Paul side of the river, very close to the airport. And we're getting around to um, many places to post and let people know, show the film and talk about uh, Kundalini and that great gift it is to be aware and to know. So, uh, Chris, I thank you for the blessing this is to me at this time, even. Thank you. Well, uh, wahe, wahe Kundalini is all I'll say to that. Wahe Kundalini. I only do this by virtue of that Kundalini that flows within me and is now currently flowing within you and and uh, Eileen yes. and, and Tara and, uh, you know, Celestial Ruby, DDG, Fasci, the many guests. Uh, yeah, yeah, Steve and, and Sigurd. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Wahe Kundalini. Kundalini is the source for all of what we're doing right now. Right now, it is the source. And so, yeah, I look forward to coming to Minnesota and, and seeing you again, Rosemary, in person. And I would look forward to anybody that can make it to Minnesota to to travel to Minnesota uh, in, in late February and also coming up in December. We'll, yes. have some, we'll have some Christmas conversations in person in various places throughout the city, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing all the new friends that I was able to make at this last uh, seminar that was held in, in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, uh, and reconnecting with, with Steve and, 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 you know, many of the other folks that, that, that put this together and is, are currently putting together the next one. So thank you, Rosemary, from, from my heart and from my kundalini for setting this up, doing all that hard work. It's joyful work. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put you back in the Shiva Blue. And Miss Santara. If you would please step forward, stepping, 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 coming up to the microphone, and here I am. (laughs) Can you hear me? (laughs) Well, I did take down some questions, and actually, you know, as usual, I don't know what you're going to speak about, so one of the questions was, why eat meat, (laughs) which came from the group, so I think that's covered. Um, well, one, you know, let me let me let me go ahead and read my response to that to the people here on on this on this uh, broadcast and and it's going to repeat some of what I've always said but I just want to you know I'm just going to read this and so here's here's what the article says why would people tell us to eat meat I'm going to put you in the blue there my dear uh, lots of lots of noise coming from your mic here. Let's see how I can do that. There. Oh, good, good. Okay. Okay. And why would Kundalini compel us to meet meat? Well, first of all, it is as the Kundalini will often task the person to have. 
meaning, you know, these are the, the, the compellings that the Kundalini communicates to us. And that is the number one reason. This tasking or compelling is as a command from the inner divine and will be obeyed no matter what constraints or, or ego-based fears or issues of resistance are placed in front of that command. Uh, it isn't about inflicting pain any more than the tiger eating the antelope is about inflicting pain. It's a natural progression, and it's a natural level of, of, of obedience uh, as, a, as a child to a parent. The child, the infant, will eat what the parent gives it to eat. And so are we as an infant in our beginning stages of the kundalini development. Uh, it is about specific nutrients that are contained in certain forms of compact proteins and enzymes and pranic energetic expression with, which plants do not provide by themselves and yet do provide as they are ingested, combined, and utilized by other forms of creation, like mammals, herbivores. Has not the divine created this world for the various forms of life to transfer energy from one form to another? Why is it so easy for vegetarians to kill and maim plants for consumption, inflicting pain in the process? And I'm responding to a questioner that, that uh, was basically promoting the, the idea that uh, people that eat meat you know, are just in it to inflict pain. And, you know, this is part of uh, what we do as meat eaters is inflicting pain and being cruel. Uh, why is it so easy for vegetarians to kill and maim plants for consumption, inflicting pain in the process? But for mammals, they draw an imaginary line stating the cruel dynamic of eating an animal. It interests me, and very few can answer that question. Is the tiger cruel? Is the shark cruel? Is the mosquito cruel? Are we so far apart from carnivores when we drive a car and kill many, many insects and some mammalian life forms? Even vegetarians drive cars. Why is the line drawn with mere consumption? Why not hold all life and all creation in the heart of love? Now, factory farming of animals and fish, I'm not including in this, as that is absolutely unjust and cruel and hurtful and certainly can be improved. And it can. I mean, the biggest room in the house there is the room for improvement. Uh, other, other forms of consumption is taught to us through the lens of the divine forces of the Mother Nature or Mother Shakti have set up a program on this world for the consumption of meat as well as plants, like the cetaceans do, like the gorillas do, like the apes do, like the chickens and the raccoons and the bears, and the list goes on. We are participants whether it agrees with our religious or spiritual values or not. We will eat as we must in order to live as we must. Plants, too, have consciousness. A blade of grass staring at the sun has its own agenda of life and its own consumption of materials from the earth, minerals and prana and bacteria that support the soils that, is, that it is growing in. These soils also contain life that also have their own unique expression of a creative agenda for their life to continue. Kundalini has its own agenda with this, within this collection of life forces upon this world. It takes that energy and uses it in such a way as to give a radical transformation to the life expression of the individual. It will use these compacted forms of energy, meat, in such a way as to transform the meat of our own physical structure. And there is no need of shame or blame or judgment. Not all paths are for everyone to walk. And perhaps even you, my friend, if you are from Europe or North America or Asia or South America or Australia or Africa, you perhaps suckled at the breast of a meat-eating woman and partook of meat as you were growing through childhood into your teens and then into an adult that partook of certain meats and other foods that helped to propel, propel you where you are now. If so, and if you are currently strictly vegetarian, even your bones are constructed of the same compact proteins that you find so offensive to consume now. It's the kundalini that makes the final determination. No matter what, we will follow that divine instruction. No matter what. 
Okay. Thank you for for waiting, Amelia. I just yeah, you know, just needed to to you know get that going. Okay, Krizen. Thank you. And now for something completely different. Someone <laughs> is curious to know your thoughts about people seeing repeated number sequences, most commonly oh, yeah. one one, and if it has anything to do with the Kundalini awakening. It has, yeah, it does. It, it, what, what, what is opening up in a person is a, a, a level of pattern uh, recognition, a level of sacred numerology that that the Kundalini understands, but the consciousness of the person does not understand. You'll see one 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 one. You'll see three three three. You'll see four four four. You'll see these types of of uh, numerical patterns that are emerging throughout your life, and and these patterns. Uh, represents specific communication from the Kundalini of being able to observe uh, s- seemingly random patterns of alignment within the the understanding uh, of the five sense individual. And so as they discern their life around us and they start looking at, oh my God, there's one, one, one. And they may get the the, the the single digit repetition one 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 all over the place. They'll see one 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 one, but then they may get and and I get three four five. I get these little mini straights. If you all play poker, you'll know what a straight is. And uh, you know it's it's just a level of pattern recognition. Nothing to be afraid of. You're not being possessed. You're not you know being you know. Uh, intimidated in any way. It's just a level of pattern recognition that the Kundalini is beginning to insert into a person's level of awareness. Okay? And as as you as you continue your journey within the Kundalini, you'll begin to understand certain numerical values that represent uh like, like say a trinity. One 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 is a trinity. Uh uh you know three 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 you know is a trinity of trinities, that type of thing. Okay, next one there, Miss Santara. Okay, thanks, Pat- Cousin. Pat- the next Pat- one. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear that. You, your voice went. Don't go. <laughs> go ahead, my dear. Okay. All right. So the next one is, um, how can a person overcome or deal with intense anxiety that comes for no apparent reason? This person has anxiety and heaviness 24-7. And, you know, no trouble sleeping, often takes a warm bath, reads a book, and is at ease, you know, while going to sleep and feeling fine. But then upon waking up, often intense anxiety hits like black ink. There's no trigger as such. So, you know, how can a person overcome or deal with this? What about the black ink? Um, the intense anxiety hits like a black ink, like oh, a I huge see. painful hole. Okay. Yeah. There were more descriptions, but I cut them. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so here's the deal. I mean, are they drinking caffeine? Do we know? I don't think. Yeah, so we don't know, right? Or you don't think they? I I don't think they do because I think they had that information. Uh, Anyway. You think you don't think they do? I don't think so. Okay, all right. So the Kundalini will will definitely uh, hyper express through the adrenals. Most of the anxiety that the people with Kundalini will have will come through the adrenal glands. Definitely come through the adrenal glands. And those, when that adrenal in, you know, you've got a lot of noise. When that adrenaline hits the bloodstream in the Kundalini person, uh, it's going to form levels of anxiety. It, the, the scenario is this the, the fight or flee uh, hormone. Uh, when it doesn't have anything to fight or flee, it doesn't just go away. The body does just doesn't go, oh, I've got nothing to fight or flee. Therefore, I'll just relax. No, no. When that fight or flee hormone hits the bloodstream, those primal uh, senses kick in. And when you don't have anything to fight or flee, well, there's a level of anxiety there. It's just the muscles tense. The breathing is short and shallow. 
you know, the, the heart is pumping and there's really nothing to do, but it's forming a great level of anxiety within the person. And so whatever you can do to, to water down perhaps some of that uh, adrenaline that's coming into your system, uh, you, you do. You know. Now, that doesn't mean you drown yourself by drinking gallons of water. You don't do that. And you certainly take out all forms of caffeine. Let me tell you, black tea has more caffeine in it than black coffee. Uh, white tea has as much uh, caffeine in it as, as black tea. Any tea that doesn't say decaf or herbal is going to have caffeine in it. And with a kundalini person, that caffeine is going to last 36 hours in the human system. So 36 hours ago, your, spot, your body right now is still... Uh, processing caffeine that it that it received 36 hours ago. So you really need to understand that when you're when you're cutting out caffeine. Okay, but this also you know t lends towards uh, high fructose corn syrups. This tends you know this lends itself towards sweeteners of you know artificial qualities or natural sweeteners. You know you got to remember that carrot juice. You know you think well carrot juice this is a really nice vegetable. I like that. It's got a nice color. You know I. Bugs Bunny likes it, and, and I like them too, and what the heck, you know. And so you drink a, a tall glass of carrot juice, fresh-pressed organic carrot juice, and that is loaded with sugars. Our body uh, basically lives off of levels of sugars. The, the food that we eat is broken down into different levels of sugar, and, the, and, the, and that is what, uh, you know, gives us the energy that we want to have. Well, if you're drinking a tall glass of carrot juice thinking that you're drinking some sort of a nice calming, relaxing vegetable before you go to bed, well, you're not going to get much sleep. You think you're going to have, you're going to have that rapid foot or leg uh, movement that they like to call a uh, syndrome, which I just love. Everything's a syndrome that they, they don't understand. Um, so, yeah, you may have that restless leg going on. You may not be able to even lie down. You may have to take a walk. You, and if you're having the kundalini uh, coming into the kidneys, well, that's going to tie in once again with the adrenal levels that are being pushed into the kidneys. Okay, so you really need to, to begin to understand that there are different levels of activity that the adrenal glands will partake of in order to give transformation into the system. And the best thing that you can do, certainly within the early aspects of the Kundalini, is to keep your meals as bland as you can. And I know that's not appetizing for people. But I'll tell you what, I mean, I, I walk this talk. You know, I, I don't put a lot of spices on things. The most I'll do is black pepper, and that, that's also something I'm compelled to do. You know, salt, no Tabasco. I used to really like Tabasco, my God. Not Tabasco, but, you know, the red hot sauce. I really like that, uh, but no, uh -uh, too much, too much uh, energetic uh, uh, distribution with that. And so try to keep your foods as bland as you can. Take the sugar out. If you must have some form of sweetener in the morning, if you are not, if you're a diurnal person, uh, in the morning have some honey with your oatmeal, your bland oatmeal. And I don't mean a whole jar of honey. I mean maybe, maybe a teaspoon, teaspoon, little spoon. Okay. And make sure that's that's organic, free range honey that that isn't you know harmfully harvested from the bees, okay? Do your best to, to do your research with the honey, okay? And, and so, you know, these levels of anxiety, to some degree with the kundalini, must be experienced. But they need to be experienced within the, the context of information. If you know what it is, if you know what is causing it, there's less uh, of, of, a, of a fear. And the less fear you have, the less anxiety you have. You may still feel that fight or flee impulse, but you'll know what's causing it. And so, therefore, your fear levels go down. Your fear levels go down. And so, so, you know, that is one of the ways for a person to really begin to, to look at their levels of anxiety, certainly when they know they have some and how they can begin to, to mitigate some of those things that they've been you know, pushing into their body by virtue of social uh, context. Next question, my dear. Thank you, Chris. And the next one isn't so much a question as I'm wondering, would you speak a little bit about twin flames? 
you know, okay. there's an awful lot of talk recently about, you know, twin flames phenomena, for the want of a better word, I think, you know. And psychics and mediums talk to their clients about their twin flame. And there's a lot around about twin flames. And people seem to make um, huge choices and decisions around this twin flame. And some people tie it into Kundalini. I'd, I'd be just interested to hear if you would speak a little about that. All right. Thank you, my dear. Well, okay, twin flames. Okay, there is a such thing as a twin flame. Don't get me wrong. There is a such thing as a twin flame, but you typically don't meet them. You don't meet them so often in the body. It's not for a physical meeting. It's for a spiritual meeting when you no longer have to take bodies again because you've reached that level of refinement. Both halves have reached that level of refinement, and and they meet, shall we say, in the heavenly fields, not in the earthly fields. And a lot of people, you know, are just so hell-bent on, oh, he's my twin flame, you know, because they're so much attracted to this one person or, you know, and they, I mean, you can <laughs> just go on and on about this one. Let me try to sum it up. You can have a soulmate. Now, a soulmate and a twin flame are two different things. Soulmate is what you share this soul, this facet of your soul that you are living in this life. And I'll just use Sigrid and John. Sigrid and John, you know, soulmate. Uh, they're both having kundalini. They're both working their way through this process. They're both uh, listening to that. I hope it's okay, Sigrid, if, if, I, uh, if I can use you as an example. Is that all right? I'll wait for your response before I uh, continue along, along that line. Um, yeah, soulmate are not twin flames and twin flames are not well twin flames can be so the, the twin flame phenomena is basically you know it's uh when when consciousness was given the opportunity to use the, the earth as a point of, of of refinement uh consciousness split itself in a male and a female and these are the twin flames these are the the shakti shiva inside each person Okay. Uh, as a representative, as a representative of the Kundalini within each person. Okay. Uh, that 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 doesn't mean that when your Shakti and Shiva come together, that it's your twin flames, you know, sacred male or sacred female. That you have that in and of yourself as a unique one, uh, one level of Kundalini uh, creation on this world. So between the two of you, your soulmate, you have four. Uh, sh you know, you have two Shivas and two Shaktis. Uh, and then you have the, the, the four that become two and the two that become one and so on and so forth. Uh, soulmates do exist, but typically people confuse their passion for another person as, as a, or as a twin flame. I meant to say twin flames. And this is just typically not true. Now, sometimes, very, very rarely, and of course, everybody's going to be that rare example. You know, rarely they do come together on the earth plane, but more, more so often they come together on the the heavenly plane, and they begin to to compare uh, life experiences, the many different lives that that each of them have had, and learning through the different choices that that aspect of the of the soul consciousness split and experienced uh, within the Kundalini context. Uh, a person can can be invaded by an entity, and that entity, we'll just say it's a woman. So an, enti an entity invades, I'll call her Marsha, and Marsha is a fictitious person, and, uh, and the, the energy, uh, an entity invades Marsha, and, and it, well, it's a male, it's a male uh, entity uh, that hasn't moved on, but it's staying in the lower astral looking for people that it can it can dominate and live through. And so the male entity comes into Marsha, and all of a sudden, you know, Marsha feels this incredible attraction for another woman. And, oh, my God, and, you know, finally this other woman and Marsha get together, and they, they you know, they have their intimate interludes, and, oh, my God, and, and, and because 
of this entity infection, uh, Marsha decides to change her sexual identity. You know, she decides, well, I'm a lesbian now, and this is this is my true path. You know, not understanding that that she's been possessed by entities and not really knowing that. This happens a lot to men and women. Okay, and then they say, oh, this person is my soulmate because I feel so complete when I'm, oh my God, it feels so good. You know, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to uh, degrade the joy and the happiness that they feel with each other. The only thing that I'm going to comment on is the artificial quality of why they're taking so much joy and and, and uh, with each other. And, and for for Marsha, at least, I don't know about the other woman, but for Marsha, it's because of an entity having stepped into her space and beginning to control her emotional attachments and her her physiological responses are going to be based uh, in, in a large degree on the emotional uh, body that that entity is, is inhabiting. Uh, and an entity infection can, infe- can have definite effect on how you're feeling, what levels of love you're feeling, especially if you invite them in, and especially if you go to mediums and psychics. That are basically, I mean, if you see them with, with the eyes of Kundalini, their clouds of entities are surrounding them, waiting, waiting for that person to step on up and say, oh, my God, you know, tell me my, what's my love life, you know, and then wonk. And, then, you, know, something, you know, something comes out of that medium's mouth, and it's typically not the medium. And, uh, and that person begins to take that as, the, as God's truth, and it just isn't. But it is part of the experience that they get to have. And they will review that experience the next time they're in the heavenly fields or the spiritual field. And they'll begin to go, oh, shit, that's what happened. Those, they got me again. They got me again. So, so twin flames just aren't that common. Now, uh, the guy that, that made the, uh, the Kundalini movie, Nitin Adso, uh, he's also done a movie on twin flames. And this has to do with the... Uh, with a, uh, I, I think that movie's been made. I'm not sure. You can go to Seven Dots Media and you can look that up. And it's a, it, it's a story about two concentration camp uh, people in World War II who came together and they knew that you know they had all these shared memories from before. They took that body, et cetera, et cetera, and they were really able to, to solidify the the understanding that they are indeed are indeed twin flames, twin souls, that type of thing, and and so you can look at that movie and they will give you a their perspective, but you got to remember that karma also plays a big, big, big uh, part in the recognition of uh, twin flames. Uh, karma will determine whether or not you even come around your twin flame, or, or even he or she comes around you. And because you're feeling strong levels of love or attraction for another person does not make that person your twin flame. Let's be clear about that. Your passion can be manipulated. Your passion, your passion can be manipulated. You understand? Your passion can be manipulated, not always by you. Which is why we like to practice energetic hygiene. We don't go to mediums. We don't listen to psychics. We don't buy in to, to these, these channelers. We just don't. I don't care how good their message is. If, if that entity that needs to possess that person can't come through as a child and go through the human process, then to me, they're lazy and they're taking a shortcut and it's not, it's not a good idea. As I've said in other programs, the entities do not have to pay for the damage that they inflict upon the person. They don't have to pay for that damage. They just pull out when the going gets hurtful. And the person who owns that body then gets to enjoy that pain. Okay. Do not listen to the channelers. Do not listen to psychics. Do not listen to mediums. Don't make life choices based upon what they tell you. For the most part, it's a lie. 
And one of the best ways to tell a lie is to base that lie in truth. Read Frank Herbert, Dune, and you'll see what, what it's like to, uh, to base a lie in truth. You could say uh, basing a lie in truth is like saying, wow, that beer is really cold. Depends on what cold is. Is it so cold that you, you freeze your mouth when you, when, when, when you put it in there? Is it, so, is it just cold in a way that it, that it fogs up your brain? I mean, how do, you do, how do you interpret cold? I mean, that's probably a poor example. I'm not used to lying. <laughs> My apologies. But the scenario is, is, is it's true. You, you know, the, the most effective lies are those lies that have a modicum of truth in them. Uh, that would be uh, Barbara, who is on that other line, Amelia. It's all good. It's all good. She's checking out the new caller, I believe. So, yeah, when you base the lie of truth, it's much easier for people to, to, uh, to buy into that lie. Most twin flame phenomena are not. They're just strong levels of passion uh, being manipulated by an entity or by a person. The kundalini can also manipulate your passion. It can take it away. No libido, as we've discussed at other programs. It can take it right away. But it can also increase it substantially. And you you just need to understand that that uh, that you know you're getting sexually excited because the kundalini wants you to be sexually excited. Not necessarily that person's your twin flame. Okay. Ah, uh, Josephine Smith. Thank you. It's good to see you, my dear. Okay. Uh, so with regards to twin flames, not so common, but it is a fact. There are twin flames. Next question, my dear. Oh, thank you, Chris. Um Okay, connected with entities again, could you speak a little bit about, you know, developing or how we develop discernment in the context of entity intrusion? How do we develop our discernment? Well, if you've gone to a medium or you've gone to a spiritualist or you've gone to a psychic surgeon or you've gone to, a, to some sort of an esoteric practitioner, Reiki, uh, then you can pretty much... Uh, know that you've been in the, the the parameter of entities that are based upon influencing and penetrating a person's energetic uh, field, number one. Mm. Okay. And that includes, in some cases, open casket funerals or, or accident scenes or, you know, things of that nature. Okay? Uh, okay. So one can encounter, and I've gone to, I've done a lot of this. I've done a lot of accident response. I've done, you know, I listen to the to uh, the, uh, the mediums and the spiritualists, and I went down to John of God's too. But I just, because of my, the condition of my birth and the, the fact that I've had Kundalini for a while, ah, I mean, it's put in the blue there, girl, big sigh. And uh, because that is a that has occurred for me, it just gave me a, a greater level of discernment of what is me and what is not me. And this is what you need to know: what are what, who are you and who are you not? Okay. So if you if you if you have gone to these people and all of a sudden you start feeling. Uh, thought, having thoughts of, of violence or having thoughts of that are not within your typical expression, well, then you can know that there is an entity that is trying to influence you. Entities are as common as, as flu viruses. There are more entities uh, in creation around this world than there are living people. And, you know, we're talking, say, 10 billion people that, you know, there's probably 20 trillion or more entities, you know, around this world. And so they're a fairly common manifestation upon this earth. 
And so for uh, for you, it, and it is a test. It is a test for you to discern who you are and who you are not. This is why when you practice the noble qualities of forgiveness, consideration, compassion, love, selfless service, you know, tolerance, honesty, truth, all of these different noble qualities, you are practicing really what it is to know who you are. Because a, for the most part, the majority of entities will not subscribe to the noble qualities, the great majority. Some will. Some will at first and then change later on. Some will just try to try to hold on to you for the entire ride of your life and just, you know, try to try to influence you for as much as possible. For those within the Kundalini well, you can you can move through that area. You can become less disturbed and less concerned about that because you know that everybody has parasites on their skin and their scalp and their blood. Parasites are, are a fact of, of, of nature on this world. And that also goes with, with spiritual or energetic parasitism. So you just stick, certainly within the Kundalini context, you stick to those noble qualities. You practice those safeties. And you make that a huge part of your life expression. And from there, you will know who you are. And the Kundalini will help you know who you are. And it will also help you know who you are not. That you are not that entity that is using you for its own selfish interests. Whether that be good or evil, you will know that you are not it. And as you know that you are not it, you can therefore begin to take it far away from what its expressions uh, and expectations of you might be. And we're back to Her Holiness for the next question. Thank you very much, Chris. So the next one is, is pregnancy safe during a Kundalini awakening? Ah, yes. Well, thank you for that, Amelia. So the question is, pregnancy safe during a Kundalini awakening? Well, yeah, absolutely it is. And it's part of the whole process, really. Many, many women experience Kundalini awakening during, during the, the birth, uh, the, the act of giving birth. Not necessarily during the act of being pregnant, uh, but during the act of giving birth, the Kundalini uh, in many women is released and they are awakened at that moment. And, and you know, a lot of the uh, postpartum depression and, you know, these types of scenarios are also based in Kundalini amplification. Of course, they deal with it with drugs when, in fact, you know, it, it can be seen as a Kundalini expression. And from there, uh, the response to postpartum depression would be the safeties, the safety protocols, if the person could do them. Uh, you know, forgiveness and love and, and all of these things. And I'm going to bring you back on, Centara, because you have somewhat of a, of a strong experience in these areas. How do you feel about it? Experience in pregnancy or in the safeties? What's your yes, question? Sorry, please. Yes. I, I do indeed, um, but at the time that I was giving birth, I wasn't aware of Kundalini. Um, did you have I wasn't aware pressure? of No. No, I did not. Oh, okay. Well, then. But I've answered that pretty much as best I may with regards to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I do know um, one or two people and somebody on the group said, you know, that she has been through two pregnancies aware of being um, Kundalini awakened and she has had excellent experiences, wonderful dreams, and the Kundalini has nurtured and loved and cared for her during this time. Um, I am very aware that my, um, my children are part, you know, I'm very aware that my children came as part of a Kundalini awakening context. I dreamed of my, I have six children, and I had four, and I always knew that there was a fifth coming. Um, I dreamed of him, and um, yeah, he arrived <laughs> 10 years later, <laughs> but I always knew he was coming, you know. And um, so there's a lot around children soon after his birth, and he was a, um, you know, an interesting delivery. Soon after his birth, 
um, I had some um, very strange out of body experiences for me at the time. You know, my ceiling, the ceiling in my room within a week, um, the ceiling within my room um, changed to the smoky sort of a thing, and I heard celestial music. And so there was a lot of things like that happened soon after his birth. Um, and he was a big baby and took a lot of effort as he came down, you know, to the pelvic floor and was being pushed out. He was over 12 pounds. So there was a lot of things going on in that area. When I look back, I can see things that um, connect in with the Kundalini without a doubt. Oh, definitely, definitely. And Elizabeth Dalton Gonzalez says, when I gave birth to my daughter at 45 years old, I, I find it amazing that, that a daughter could be 45 years old at birth, but I'll just leave that alone. <laughs> Sorry. That's a joke. It's a little humor there, very little, I'm sure. When I gave birth to my daughter at 45 years old, I was very aware of the Kundalini awareness being present, especially right before she finally came out after 24 hours of labor. Wow. Yeah. Mm. I would think you'd be very, very, you would be very, very sensitive after 24 hours. Either either very, very sensitive or very, very numb. I don't know which. <laughs> so congratulations to you and your daughter, uh, dear Elizabeth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, Amelia, next question, if there is one. Um. Okay. Fill in the time there for two seconds. I was on a different page. Um, I'm, um, I think that's it, actually, Chrism. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Well, now, if anybody else has questions that they would like oh, to call, the number is 347 934 There is. Four zero zero two six. Yes, Amelia. There was another one here actually, and um, it was from a week or two ago. It was about the healing group that we have, you know, at the Kundalini Awakening Systems Healing Group. And somebody asked, you know, I understand the way of sending healings to others. What about when we are wishing and hoping for goodness to happen in a person's life? At one time, I would have prayed for such and such to happen, and um, if it is God's will. In what form, as a Kundalini Awakening, person do we do this now and how do we send healing um, because we're surrendered to life yes okay as a kundalini awakening person we go straight to the kundalini because the, the, the scenario with this is many 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 people have uh, afflictions that are not accidental to them even though it may have occurred in an accident or it may have occurred out of the blue or out of their conscious control there is a karmic uh, um, stipulation for that person to even have that that issue and so what we do and we are allowed to help people we are allowed to do this and so what we do is we ask the kundalini to give uh, the amount of healing that that person can have and hold that is appropriate for them as per the Kundalini. And the Kundalini knows their karma. It sees what needs to be done. And those good wishes can be given into that person in that way. You don't even need to ask permission for prayers. Okay. But you cannot go into it yourself, and you don't want to go into it yourself. And, and another way you can do this is, of course, the power of prayer. So we'll just say that uh, John O'Connor has a sliver in his toe. And, uh, you know, he was walking barefoot outside, and, you know, he got a sliver in his, in his left big toe. And it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, we're having all kinds of pain, and it's limping, and he doesn't want to, you know, you can't wear a shoe, you can't, you know, it's just... So let's say it got infected or something like that. Do you, is it okay if I use John O'Connor as an example, Amelia? Thinking about it now, they're both kind of converging with each other. I don't know. Why should he use me? <laughs> I give you my full permission. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so John, Amelia takes John's scenario to the healing group, to the community healing group on either Yahoo or on, on Facebook. And uh, they are there both. 
And from there, uh, groups of people come together for John's healing, and they go through their kundalini, and their kundalini looks at John's karma and looks at at what can be done to aid and 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 give give uh, safety and service to John's situation through their love. The kundalini loves to see people do this. This is a form of selfless service. This is in the safety for crying out loud. This is, you know, being in those healing groups is a wonderful way of giving selfless service to other people. And it, and it's even better because it, it's in a way that you don't see their face. You can't, you know, they're not warm and fluffy right there in front of your face. You know, you have to just sit down and go, okay, to John, of Con oh, John O'Connor, my kundalini please give John O'Connor the healing to his left big toe that he can have and can hold within your understanding of his of his karma. Please give my love and healing to him. And it will do that, as is appropriate to John. Maybe a little teaching about wearing socks. In addition. <laughs> or shoes. <laughs> no, John, John, I mean, you know, you don't, I don't think you go barefoot in Ireland that much. Do you go barefoot that much in Ireland, Amelia Centauro? No, not it's typically. It, no, no, we do not. We do have shoes, but <laughs> it's, it's illegal. It's, Mind it's, you, interesting. It, when John was, illegal. when John, <laughs> <laughs> when John was growing up, he went to school without shoes. You know, they didn't have shoes back in his day, and we go barefoot around the house a lot here. But typically, no, not in fact. Hence, hence the slivers. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah, that's that's pretty much the understanding behind uh, giving a healing through the kundalini. Okay, thank you, Kristen. And you know, it's just occurred to me that something happened yesterday that maybe I could share and ask you about. Please. To myself, would that be okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so I went, so I I went to Tesco, and you've been there with me, and so you know what I'm speaking of that shopping center. Um, I went there yesterday, and I went there again today, and what happened yesterday that I'm going to tell you about now didn't happen today. So um, it's been really interesting for me. Um, I went into Tesco, and from the moment that I went into the, um, the shopping center, I was overwhelmed is probably too strong a word, but I was very, very conscious of everybody in the shopping center. It started off like that, and I felt pressure on my chest and felt pressure on my throat. Right into my throat started to burn that whole area. And then as I was walking through down to a particular shop, I became very aware of, it was like I wasn't quite, everybody, I could feel people's pain. And I could feel illness. That seemed to be how unwell people were, how depressed people were. Now, I wasn't empathetic to it in the sense that it didn't affect me, but yet it seemed to affect me physically because I could feel it in my chest. But I was observing all of this. But it was very, very strong and it lasted. I was in the shop. I went into the other shop. I went down to the post office the whole time. Somebody would come in and I would feel, you know, there was so much unwellness and so much depression, really, that people were in, and lifelessness that I could feel from people. And when I left, the um, shopping centre and I did my business and when I left the shopping centre, boom, it was gone. I went back today and <laughs> one, you know, um, nothing, absolutely nothing, just normal and as before. It was like all my filters were taken away yesterday or something and I, I don't know, I don't know why or what that was about. Maybe you could help me with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is a typical response. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. What, what were you saying? About? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Is, the Kundalini was giving you an example of, of of what 
uh, you can feel within your footprint. Remember, the footprint can be up to a mile wide and encompass every living thing within that parameter of that mile. And uh, for that one moment, in that one time, you were given the experience of knowing just what the humans were feeling. Okay, you're given that, and it was a real opportunity for you, really, was to really to crank open that love and that desire, that healing, that affection, and that... I did, that, I did, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very I important. did that. Yeah. Actually, I've been doing that for quite a while, and in the populations, as you know. And so, from, you know, that that was beginning. When I got out of the car and began to move, that begins. Um, but this hasn't happened to me before. And so I still did and very consciously did, but I was aware, yeah, it didn't make it stop is what I'm saying to you. <laughs> well, it shouldn't. It's not supposed to yeah. be. Yeah. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to educate you, and it's supposed to kind of show you the the tremendous level of of uh, resource and and sensation and understanding that you can have when you have that kundalini to that degree, when you when it's really communicating with you in a very strong, strong way. And for some people, they feel that all the time, all the time. But it takes someone of a, of a, of a person getting into some uh, some mid-level advancements uh, to be able to appreciate what's going on, to take the, the appropriate uh, measures for people, uh, uh, you know, for their for their healing and for their with their current levels of appropriate joy and love and, and their process of life that they're going through. Uh, Ireland, England, Scotland, France, Switzerland, Germany, United States, I mean, Canada, Japan, China. People are in various stages of depression, of pain. It's not easy being a, a life form on this world. It's not easy. And it's not supposed to be easy okay but for a kundalini awakened person you know it's it's part of the lay of the land that telepathy goes a very very long way and this would be broad spectrum telepathy but also uh, telepathy mixed with a level of empathy because you can feel their disease you can feel their depression you know that you can see you know in many ways you can see the pictures you know, you can mm-hmm. see that swirling around in their aura. You can feel it. Okay? And you just open you open yourself to the divine within you, and you release those healings. And the nice thing about it is, you know, there's no self-aggrandizement involved with it. And this is what makes it even stronger. You won't be able to ease the pain of every person in the world, but you can ease some of them. It goes back to that whole starfish story. You know, a, uh, a young girl was, was, a man saw a young girl throwing stuff into the ocean, and as he, as he walked up to her on the beach, you know, there were thousands of starfish that had been stranded on the on the ocean, and he, and he says, you know, that doesn't really matter. You know, what you're doing, throwing it back, it doesn't matter at all. And she threw another one in, and she said, it matters to that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it mattered to yeah. that, and in this way, you can say it mattered to that one hundred. It mattered to that one thousand. It matters, and this is another example, I think, of uh, of helping us understand the the important quality of of always, always, always doing your best to transmit the noble qualities into the populations. Control your thinking. Control. Uh, the levels of, of inner depression that you may have within your inner dialogue, that you're not worthy, that you're not happy, that you're not growing, that you're not wealthy, that you're not this or that, and start replacing it with a positive uh, inner dialogue. I am worthy, and God has chosen me for a very special job, and here I am, willing to do it with joy and love and grace and truthfulness and honesty and and, and compassion and service, and I do this now all the time. This is my life goal. Mm-hmm. 
And I think it's a very it's a very good commentary on you and your process. I mean, mm-hmm. Did you just blow your nose on air? Is that what you just did? What? I you just blew your nose on air. Oh, you are so <laughs> good. Oh, <my> God. <laughs> <laughs> Can't, she blew her nose on it. You all, you all heard it. You're my witnesses. <laughs> you're, you're, you're more than welcome, uh, Julie. And, uh, and I think everybody needs to hear that. Everybody needs to hear that. Julie wrote, uh, "Oh boy, thank you for talking about this. I needed it, and and I think everybody needs to hear this. And it's good to be reminded. It's so easy to just say, oh, just practice the safeties, practice the noble qualities, blah blah blah. But you got to put it into the context of your everyday life expression, your everyday inner dialogue that you have with yourself as you're looking in the mirror and you're like, oh God, my beard's crooked. How did my beard? Oh, it's bed beard." I have bed beard, and that's why my beard is crooked. It's not just because I have a crooked beard. It's because I have, I have bed beard. You know, and so this is something that Chrisom would say if he looked in, his, in, his, in, the, in the mirror in the morning. So, you know, you just got to <laughs> kind of lighten up with your inner dialogue. Change those thoughts. Most of you have been depressed enough already. You know what that's like. You know what it's caused by. You know how it feels. Enough already. Because you have Kundalini, now you can choose your permanent lifestyle expression. You can choose your permanent emotional expression. You can choose to be happy. No matter what life throws your way, you can choose to have an inner dialogue that supports yourself and those around you. And supports the kundalini within you. You could choose to have this. Let me see if her holiness is. If she finished blowing. Did you finish everything? You need to. You need to belch. You need to belch. And <laughs> um, I apologize for blowing my nose, which everybody finish. knows I did not. <laughs> just, just finish. Finish the pint. Well, you have to finish the pint. <laughs> Um, I just want to add there that somebody on the group um, with regard to your posting to do with why eat meat says, I'm going to read it out. She says, Chris, I'm amazed at this post. I am going through a phase now where I am considering to eat meat again. I haven't wanted it for quite some time, and now all of a sudden I keep feeling like I need to dig in again. It's all about getting the right balance within, and I believe Kundalini is showing me this about the process. I have gone back and forth with this feeling for years now, so blessings to you. Well, people will go back and forth, you know. Um, Magdalene de Deus, you know, she's she's going back and forth. Amelia Simpara goes back and forth. I go back and forth sometimes. I mean, it's rarely that I that I'll eat a a cow or hamburger or anything. I just seriously, it's rare for that to occur. Uh, but I'll have venison or I'll have chicken or I'll have turkey and and you know what? When I have that turkey. We have wild turkeys around here all the time. You know, they come in and they chew up your garden and do shit on your car and whatnot, which is fine, both kind of. Uh, but they, I feed them. I feed them. They get fed every day away from the car. <laughs> they get fed every day. And I feel that as as I consume the turkeys, and they they feed me, so do I feed them. And I like that, and I'm good with that. And they seem good with it, too. So I invite those of you who can uh, help the wild land, the wild animals, the wild creatures, you know, help them by not using Monsanto products in any way, shape, or form. Help them by not using uh, bio-engineered products that try to short-circuit nature. Don't buy and eat glowing tomatoes. I know, I know. I'm sorry, Amelia. I know how you feel about the glowing tomatoes. Don't go out of your way 
to get in to to try to subdue nature. Go out of your way to blend with nature. To be that natural kundalini expression of the divine upon this world, which is what set nature in motion in the first place. Be that person who gives a positive dialogue about yourself and and, and how you influence uh, not only the people in Tesco, but the people all around you all the time. The, the environment, the animals, the insects, the bacteria, the mammalians, the the, the, the avians, the, the fish, the polywogs, the cetaceans, everything is influenced by your kundalini. You are a lighthouse to many forms of creation, not just people. And it's really not all about people here. It's just people have made it that way. It's about all creation. All creation counts. All creation matters. All creation is what it's all about. Not just one form of it, you know, that has the, uh, the, the, the egotistical value, self-valuation of where it stands within, you know, the, uh, the context of everything else. All creation is what matters. And it's what matters to the Kundalini, too. All right. Well, if you have any questions, I'll give you a few more seconds to, to give it a call. It's 347, area code, 347-934-0026. And I would like to thank Eileen Laurel and Rosemary Goliath for their continuing support of the, the Kundalini Awakening program. Uh, I would I would like to bring Eileen on right now. Hello, Miss Eileen. How are you? Hi, Chris. I'm fine. Thank you. Hey, so you're putting together a new CD, right? Or, or we got the CD thing going? Yes. Um, Amelia or Centara is sending out the CDs in countries other than Canada and the U.S. I'm sending them out um, in the U.S. and Canada, and we welcome any orders. Uh, people okay. can actually go on the YouTube channel, on your channel. The early uh, videos actually have some of the music, so if they want to sample some of the music. And I also found, again, on the Yahoo page in the files, there are a couple of your songs listed there that people can listen to. So, well, thank yeah. you. Thank you, my dear. And I just want to thank you for, I mean, Eileen. Eileen was the person who took the very first video that I have uploaded to uh, YouTube. Um, so I just want to thank you for your long and, and, and diligent service to the many, many Kundalini people out there that we are reaching. Thank you, my dear. You're welcome, Chris. All right. I'm going to put you in the blue. And I would like to bring Her Holiness, the Celtic Queen of Questionable Comforts, Amelia Centaro. Amelia? Uh huh. Finish the pint. Are you done? <laughs> it's gone. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> if you have to belch, go right ahead. I know there's a lot of carbonation. Um, no, no, thank, no. I'm used to I want to thank you and John uh, for having this radio show. And uh, I want to thank you both for, for putting in the time. I know it's 11 o'clock at night. It's probably close to 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock at night now. So I just want to thank you both for supporting Kundalini Awakening Systems the way you have over the years. And uh, it looks like she just went right off there, put her back on. And and uh, so thank you both. Okay. Yep. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Steve actually had a question. He made. He said, "Why the pendulum swinging from good to bad, so to speak?" And I asked him to clarify what he meant further. And I can see he's typing. So can we wait and oh. see? Here he goes. One week listening to my K, the next week hearing it but not paying attention to it. Thank you, Amelia. Ah, well, you know, that's really more your choice. 
um, from from what you're writing there. Um, why why one week you're listening to it and the one week you're not? Um, you know, I would suggest that you, you you know you put in more of a diligence in listening to it all the time. Don't let there be a time when there isn't uh, that Kundalini voice within you talking with well, not you know using words, but giving you feelings of of, of the divine connection that you have. Uh, be, you know, for you staring at a lawn and just feeling the life force emanating from that lawn, staring at yourself and seeing the life force emanating from your own eyes. I mean, how can you not pay attention to the Kundalini in that context, Steve? Um, yeah, and I see you're typing some more. So, so it is hard work at first, but... Once you start doing it all the time, Steve, it's really, it becomes natural work, and it, it, it's really a step up. Uh, it's a step up in, in, a, in a direction that is really, really uh, important uh, for a person to experience, and it, and it does begin to sculpt the, your future experiences that you will be having with, you know, in this regard, you'll get stronger and stronger and stronger. And it won't be such hard work after a while. It's always there. It's a thought away. I mean, that isn't very hard. It's just a thought away. You just have to really look at where your ego controls are, are, are controlling your life and put those aside and let the Kundalini controls step in to a proper position of control and engagement in how you are, are meeting your life and how your life is meeting you. Uh, so thank you, Steve. Excellent questions. And thank you, Centara, for your excellent questions. Thank you, Rosemary and Eileen and, and Julie and Elizabeth and Fasci and the guests, uh, 3051, 3094, 3096, 3248, MJ Henderson. Secret Edworthy, Steve Jarecki, and Suka, thank you all for joining us in this program about your Kundalini Awakening experience. And I invite you to this channel. Same time next week, uh, we'll be having another conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experience. Thank you, everyone. Good night.